Thanks very much, Phil, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this meeting. It's been a fantastic event, and thank you very much for staying this long. I know I'm very much appreciative of the uh, three days of physical inactivity that's been gone on when you stay at these conferences, but thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking about the ageing athlete, and in the broader context, how we might use master athletes as a means to understand more about the biology and underlying physiology of the ageing process per se. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my... Uh, collaborator Professor Norman Lazarus in the work that I'm uh, presenting today. I'm going to start um, with some high-impact publications. Uh, this was in the Times back in September, which highlighted one of the key points that I want to make. We're all living longer, but to an unhealthy old age. Um, and this was li uh, literally last week. I've spoiled my joke. <laughs> In one paper in the Metro, we must work till we're 75 before we can retire. But uh, if you're a Sun reader, you've got to be 81. <laughs> that was the, this last week. So we know we have an increasing ageing population. There's lots of challenges in regard to pensions that we're all fully aware of, um, in regard to health and social care, etc., etc. So one thing we might start by asking is that if you're an athlete, are you going to actually live longer? And there's a recent... Uh, systematic review that's just come out, looking at 54 publications, and generally found that actually there's some evidence for superior longevity, uh, particularly in endurance athletes and in those in mixed sports, but actually no idea as to what those mechanisms really might be. A second question might be, are former athletes, elite athletes, actually healthier in later life? And that's just come out this year in the Scandinavian Journal. Uh, 393 former male Finnish elite athletes, aged 72 years, found to have lower body fat, low risk of the metabolic syndrome, etc., etc. Um, this seemed to offer some protection, being an elite athlete, but the key point being it doesn't seem you're going to bank anything. Current exercise levels and physical activity uh, habits are clearly key factors. So we're not going to be banking being an athlete in our youth in regard to uh, superior uh, function in later life. Now, Mike Joyner touched upon this particular uh, gentleman, A.V. Hill, back in 1925, said, in the study of the physiology of muscular exercise, there's a vast store of accurate information in the records of athletic sports and racing. And we can understand lots about physiology by looking at racing and records, and we can apply that to the process of ageing. What I'm showing here are the up-to-date athletic records for the 100 metres and the 10,000 metres on the track. So what we have is Usain Bolt here, you have uh, Florence Griffith Joyner here for the women. And what we can see is that there's essentially a reasonably linear decline in performance, both in uh, hundreds and in the 10K, until we kind of reach sort of 70s and beyond when we start to see this curve, curvy linear effect. We suddenly get a lot, lot worse in performance. And that's an interesting observation. It's further shown here in this paper from Tanaka and Seals where they've looked at swimming and now what they've got is the instantaneous rates of decline and this highlights in swimming in both the 1500 metres uh, and the 50 metre sprints that this break point seems to be occurring at around 70 years of age. These in records provide interesting, interesting information but we've got to be careful. The assumption that an athlete here is the same as an athlete here is the same as an athlete here is of course wrong. It's unlikely that Usain Bolt is going to be appearing age 70 on a running track. So we're looking at cross-sectional data, the best at any time in the world at any given age. It appears to decline linear, as I said, until we get around the eighth decade and have this break point here. But what does this break point suggest? When we looked at lots of other functions, there's this suggestion that everything declines linearly as we get older. But what is this break point suggesting? We could argue that athletic performance is the ultimate integrative physiology. Is there some breakdown in integrative function that's occurring around this time point? We don't know, but they're interesting observations. We've also had a lot of talk this week about this integrated system, that our VO2 max integrated in terms of respiratory function, cardiovascular function in the muscle, producing uh, or providing oxygen to the mitochondria. And we have athletes like this is Emil Zatopek in the 1948 London Olympics, one of the all-time great endurance athletes. This system is the system by which his performances are regulated, particularly in regard to cardiac output. We know that cardiac output, maximal cardiac output, is our prime determinant of VO2 max. 
And this is a meta-analysis of 242 studies published a few years ago now. But what was done here was they divided into groups of sedentary, active, and highly endurance-trained athletes. And we can see that there's progressive and essentially linear decline with increasing age. In addition to the cardiovascular changes and changes in maximal cardiac output, what we see is the role of skeletal muscle in this particular regard. Because what we have here is our normalization to, in mils per kilo per minute in men, uh, sorry, in women and men, so a 30% decline from age 30 to 70. But when we account rather for the changes, uh, sorry, when we account for muscle mass changes and normalize using creatinine excretion, we see that the loss in VO2 max is not nearly as great as when we normalize the body weight. So if we talk about skeletal muscle, and functions other than endurance exercise, we can consider we have also other integrative functions. So the performance of tasks like this are not really relying on integration of your cardiovascular and respiratory system so much as the integration of the neuromuscular system shown here. So if we look at uh, elite master weightlifters, this is data taken from the 1999 World Masters uh, weightlifting championships where you have two events, the clean and jerk and the snatch, these two Olympic disciplines both involve lifting a weight above your head. So these aren't world records, they're performance data from that particular competition. And you can see, again, there's essentially linear decline. No break point observed here. But what we want to point out is something like this in regards to absolute function, where you've got an 87-year-old competitor still able to lift above his head 55 kilos. Now, it's appropriate being in Nottingham that I can show these data because this was actually obtained using the Nottingham Power Egg, which was developed here, and we made some modifications to that. But we took that particular apparatus to that uh, event and made some measurements on the lifters in, some, in terms of their lower limb explosive power, and we compared that with some healthy but otherwise uh, well, sedentary individuals. And we can see that the lifters are on average about 35% more powerful, but the key point being that if you want to generate around 300 watts of power, you're doing that as an 80-year-old lifter, you're doing it as a 55-year-old sedentary person. So essentially, there's a buyback in years of 25 years. So that leads me on to muscle. And what we traditionally see is the big problem, or one of the big problems in aging, which is the loss of skeletal muscle mass process known and characterized relatively recently as sarcopenia. So this is an MRI taken through the mid-thigh of a perfectly healthy 31-year-old woman and a sedentary 85-year-old woman. And you can see quite clearly in this example the loss of contractile tissue mass that's occurring uh, between these two individuals. So what is sarcopenia characterized by? Well, if we take a biopsy from a young person and look at a couple of hundred muscle cells, this is stained for TE7, marker of connective tissue, we have oil red O and DAPI for nuclei, and we do the same thing on quite a sedentary muscle. I guess this is quite an extreme example, but it highlights the point shown on the MRI, which is you've got infiltration of connective tissue, and you've got accumulation of fat, as well as rather poor quality shaped muscle fibers. So we've got infiltration of fat and connective tissue. We've heard already about the fact we get motor unit loss and remodeling. We get an atrophy of type two muscle fibers, and these are the force velocity relations of a type 1 and a type 2 fiber, showing that a loss of those fibers is going to have a particularly detrimental effect on power. In addition to that, if we were to look functionally at individual fibers, so this is a chemically skinned human fiber, and these are type 1 fibers and these are type 2A fibers, and this is the force per unit area. These are activated at uh, 12 degrees C. But what they're showing here is that if you're a young person, you're generating around uh, 42 kilonewtons per meter squared, but you get a loss in specific force or first force per unit area if you're an elderly person who is sedentary. So you're getting a loss over and above that would be expected due to the loss of muscle mass alone. So what are these factors? What's causing sarcopenia? Well, we don't fully understand what's causing sarcopenia at all, and I use the word associated here very carefully. We've heard lots about anabolic resistance from Phil and the group in Nottingham showing you get decreased uh, synthetic responses to feeding and exercise. Um, but there's also other factors, inflammation, metabolic dysregulation, changes in circulating anabolic hormones, impaired re repair and regeneration from exercise-induced damage, all of which 
have been implicated in some way in uh, causing sarcopenia. But how much of these can we really ascribe to actually the aging process? Who do we study? What is the model? If you want to understand the inherent aging process, who do we study? And of course we know there are groups working on Drosophila, on C. elegans, lots of animal models. We can study cells in culture. We have human models of aging, disease models like progeria. Intensive care has been viewed as a model of accelerated aging. Tim Peake up on the International Space Station at present can be viewed as going through an accelerated aging and deconditioning process. So we can learn from all of these, but what is it really telling us about human physiological aging? Which model do we study? Are we looking at gerontology or are we talking geriatrics? And that's an often a blurring that occurs. Are we considering lifespan or health span? Often when you're measuring these kind of models, you're considering this as your outcome. But as I said in my first slide, that was that uh, picture from the Times last year, we're all living longer but not to a healthier old age. It's really health span that we're interested in driving forward. Just one example, this is cells in culture. So these are cells in culture taken from young and older individuals and passaged up to senescence. So we've replicated them in culture until they have this uh, phenotypic change when they become senescent. They've got a different morphology, the nuclei is changing. Um, and what we can see when we senesce cells is that we get increased markers of DNA damage. This is gamma H2AX in cells shown in the nuclei here. But when you take muscle samples from elderly people and study them without going through this process, they're not like this at all. They're just like the young muscles. So what do we learn from models like senescence and culture that inform us about whole body human physiology and ageing? Uh, many of you will probably recognise Jim Royal. Um, so an individual spent much of his time in front of the television, uh, not eating high quality food, drinking Guinness as you can see here, berating his wife. Is this an individual that we're going to use as a model to study the ageing process? And I would argue that, that we wouldn't. At the other end of the continuum, of the focus of this talk, we have these kind of individuals who are still highly athletic, undertaking lots of physical activity and eating well and doing all the other things that would associate with a healthy lifestyle. So we have an exercise continuum. But many of the studies that we see in the literature are erring towards this kind of individual, to sedentary, perhaps clinically healthy, but mainly sedentary individuals. And we could argue that as inactivity is deleterious to health at any age, it's going to contaminate our understanding of the ageing process because we've got this interaction of disuse and ageing. So one could argue we should put a health warning on those kind of studies. But the same, I'm not just picking on human studies, the same could be said for animal studies. Charlotte Peterson made the very good point in her presentation. Mice will run. This is a study where we monitored the activity of an animal that, given a free wheel in its cage, will run voluntarily at least five kilometres a night. So if you're putting an animal in a cage and making it sedentary for 24 months or however long you study it, you're not just studying the ageing process, you're studying the ageing process plus imposed sedentary behaviour. So what's new? Uh, well, Hippocrates had it all sorted out. That which is develops and that which is not used wastes away. If there's any deficiency in food or exercise, the body will fall sick. More recently, in a quote that we often, as exercise physiology lecturers, say, exercise is not a mere variant of the condition of rest, it is the essence of the machine, from Barcroft. More recently, Frank Booth, our genes evolved with the expectation of requiring a certain threshold of physical activity. In the late Paleolithic era, when we were evolving, hunter-gatherer lifestyles of 50,000 to 10,000 years BC, we were really physically active. So this should be our default position. And if we're not doing that, then we have other factors which are contaminating the ageing process. So due to the pernicious effects of physical activity, I think we can argue that the physiology of human inherent ageing cannot be studied in sedentary people. So what we actually need to do is study OAPs. And what is the relationship in these people between age and function. Can we just count the rings on a tree to find out how old they are? We can't. So what I mean by OAPs are optimally aging phenotypes. So we, I'm going to report now a study we published last year in the Journal of Physiology 
where we did a deep phenotyping of 125 amateur cyclists aged between 55 and 79 years of age. So they came into the laboratory, we made numerous measurements on them. The key points being they were non-elite cyclists. They predominantly belong to the ORDAC Cycle Club, which is a non-competitive organisation. You actually just complete distances in certain times. There's not a winner or loser. So these are amateur cyclists who just love cycling. They're not competitive athletes, not elite athletes. The entry criteria is that males had to be able to cycle 100k in under six and a half hours. Females, uh, 60k in five and a half hours, completing a couple of rides three weeks prior to testing. So quite stringent entry criteria. Why do we study people who are doing so much exercise? Well, the point is, we don't actually know how much exercise you need to do to age optimally. So our viewers, well, you're going to take people who are doing as much as is reasonably possible and expected, and we'll start with those. And then we can maybe work, start working down and titrating down. And we measured a whole number of things, so I haven't got time to show you all of them. Um, but I'm going to start focusing on VO2 max. It's obviously been a popular measure to describe. And this is our data, uh, VO2 max in litres per minute against the age of the uh, subjects, the females and the males. And we got a reasonably tight correlation between uh, age and function in both the males, uh, both the females and in the males. And in fact, this is the best correlation of all of the measures that we made. The closest correlation with the chronological age of the uh, participants was VO2 max. So if we normalise to body mass, we see that the gap between the males and the females begins to go down. But if I add in data from the Wilson um, systematic review for sedentary individuals, and we take an 80-year-old's value, it hits our sedentary line at around here. So now we're looking at something like a 30 to 35-year age advantage. So we're still ageing, but in terms of function, it's a 35-year age advantage over sedentary people. Now, to be even fair, more fair to female cyclists, we then normalise the data to fat-free mass. And at that point, our superior participants turned out to be the females, shown here and shown here. What I'd like to do with this slide, though, is make this point. What happens if we look at the data slightly differently? Let's create bandwidths of function. So let's assume you want to have some functions around 56 to 59 or so uh, mils per kilo fat-free mass per minute. We can see this from the data. It's an obvious point that I'm making, but I think it's a point that often gets missed and overlooked. So what we've done here is replotted all of that data. We've now put the age on this axis and our bandwidths of function on this axis. And what we're showing here is that same data set on the left-hand graph shown here. And it's making the simple point that you can have quite a narrow bandwidth of function and be aged anywhere between 55 and 75 years of age. So how do we understand aging from these kind of data? People are so different, even in these really homogeneously active individuals. These kind of data just are, are important in terms of application to the population. Obviously, VO2 max is a measure you don't make on a regular basis on clinical populations. But this was a paper in which, that rather than using VO2 max, they'd exercise to the ventilatory threshold or the gas exchange threshold and looking at patients in regard to their um, predicting those at risk of uh, post-operative complications and increased length of hospital stay. And they came up with a value of 10 mils per kilo per minute, above which you are kind of OK, and below which you may be in trouble. So just putting our data set, again, it's a bit noisy, but we put these, these lines here and extrapolate to age 100, then the values essentially double that safety margin. So in terms of where these individuals are sitting physiologically and in terms of global health status, we take VO2 max as the best marker of integrative function, as we know from uh, Claude Bouchard's work and others, that it's uh, a great predictor of all-cause mortality, etc. We looked at numerous other functions, and I'm going to very quickly whip through the, with muscle strength, muscle power on the cyclogometer, a, a whole series of other things nerve conduction, velocity, H reflex, balance and sway. There's lots of these data I'm not even going to show you because the point is that the relationship between age and function is actually really poor in this age group. Now, we were quite tough in this study 
because we, we don't actually have a very young group and we don't have a very old group. And normally correlations are driven by the fact that you have high functioning young people here and very poorly functioning elderly people right down here. And that the bit in the middle becomes this sort of cloud and the associations between age and function seem to be disappearing. And what we're looking at here, we're arguing, is the innate ageing process, at least in this cross-sectional study. What about muscle? These data are not yet published, but we took muscle biopsies from the individuals, and this is the ATPA stain examples. 55-year-old, 79-year-old competitor. We were unable to distinguish the age of the participants on the basis of the muscle. The morphology I showed you in the slide earlier, although it's a different uh, stain here, these fibres are fine. It's indistinguishable from a young muscle. And in fact, when we look at the size of the type 2 fibres, we're not seeing any relationship between age and function. We're not getting a decline in type 2 fibre area. This was mentioned as well earlier, that the fact there may be some protective effect of aging, uh, sorry, some protective effect by being a master runner. In our paradigm, these are the individuals who are the inherent ages, not these. And this was data showing that the motor unit number seems to be better preserved compared to the old sedentary. Of course, that was a topic from Jamie uh, McPhee's group earlier in the day, those that were here, and data on the vastus lateralis muscles are saying, well, actually, maybe that's not the case. So we watch this space, because if it's not the case, and we're looking at something like this, then are we looking at an inherent aging process? So something that has declined in both sedentary people and in the athletes, you can argue, is an inherent aging process. Let's look at single muscle fiber data again. So this is the same study from Giuseppe D'Antone as I showed earlier. But I'm now going to show you the full data set. So what I showed you before was the young subjects versus the sedentary individuals. Actually, these in the checkered bars are 70 years of age individuals who happen to be master runners. They don't show specific force loss. What you do see is an increase in specific force loss in regard to the level of inactivity and sedentariness that's occurring. So we're trying to disentangle again. Is this ageing or is it sedentary behaviour? In this instance, it would argue we've got no real problem for people who are very active. Very, very immobilised older people are in big trouble. But it's not purely an ageing phenomena. I put the title here, we get wrong-footed by data. So clinicians particularly will use age-predicted values. Lung function is a classic example. We'll use age-predicted values for FVC, FEV1. And we will use the FEV1 to FVC ratio as an indicator, an index of a likelihood of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, for example. So below 70%, you're going to be in big trouble. Well, most of our subjects in that study are in big trouble then. But what it doesn't really show, that one particular metric, is the fact that these data and these data in terms of FEV1, they are on average about 15 to 20% above age predicted. But here, they are around 45% above age predicted. So you're skewing these data without seeing the bigger picture. The other bigger picture would be where well, we di diagnosed or classified seven of the subjects as being sarcopenic, who are just able to cycle 100 kilometres three times for testing. They're not functionally limited people, but they've been diagnosed on the classic uh, DEXA scan uh, criteria as being sarcopenic. Six subjects were diagnosed as osteoporotic. We chose cyclists for a variety of reasons, but one thing that cycling is certainly not particularly good at is bone. It's not giving you the mechanical signals that uh, bones particularly like, and no surprise that perhaps we diagnose six individuals that are osteoporotic. These are some new data. So it's from this study, and it's in a collaboration with uh, Janet Lord up in Birmingham. And we've just started to be looking at various aspects of immune function. And she has a group, uh, a cohort of healthy young individuals, and a, co a cohort of healthy older people who are the same age as our master cyclists, but they're essentially sedentary, but otherwise clinically healthy. And what we see is an increase in sedentary, uh, sorry, increase in senescent T cells in this population as a result of age. And when we look at our master cyclists, actually, we're seeing the same thing. So our argument would be we're looking at an inherent ageing phenomenon <coughs> here because it's in both groups. Whereas when we start looking at um, the percentage of CD4 naive T cells and CD4 memory T cells, we see something slightly different. Again, this is 
the young and the healthy old, health, young, and this is the ratio of the two. But when we look at the master cyclist data, we see that, in fact, they are different from the healthy old and no different from the young, the same here and the same here. So he would be arguing what we're looking at now is a phenomenon that's not an age-related phenomena, but it's an interaction of age and disuse because we're just not seeing it in these individuals. OK, so to conclude, um, the decline in integrative whole body function as a result of ageing, I think, can be tracked quite nicely by changes in athletic performance. Master athletes or vigorous exercises, I think, can be considered an appropriate model to study the biology of inherent human ageing, as they are fee free from the confounding negative factors. Even in cohorts of similarly athletic phenotypes, the relationship between age and physiological function is actually not that strong. We need longitudinal studies to remove the effects of the cross-sectional study designs that are existing in most studies. But it's clear to say that master athletes, veteran athletes, vigorous exercisers have generally superior global physiological function compared to sedentary people of the similar age. And what that gives them is an age advantage. They're essentially buying back years of function relative to their sedentary counterparts. So I'll conclude with a non-physiologist. Uh, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. It's what George Bernard Shaw wrote all those years ago. It was actually very personal. And with that, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Norman Lazarus and all the individuals who've done all the work. And this is actually our group at the first BBET meeting four years ago. Thank you very much. <laughs>